for putting the program together and coordinating the Zoom. I am happy they were able to host Dr. Margaret Manchester tonight as she shares what she has learned from her research into the local Varen case. I have read a little bit about the case and I'm eager to learn more about it from what she's learned and about to share with us. A native of Budapest, Hungary, Dr. Manchester has been teaching courses in American women's history, diplomatic history, and the history of the Cold War at Providence College, where she is an associate professor of history in the Department of History and Classics. This book project, The Puritan Family and Community in the English Atlantic World, being much affiliated with Conscious, resulted from a collaboration between the Varen Colonial Women's History Project, co-sponsored by the Rhode Island Commission on Women and the National Park Service at Roger Williams Memorial Park. Her new project involves a spy story in Cold War Hungary. So join me in welcoming Dr. Margaret Manchester. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna uh, just start my screen share if I may. Can everyone see that all right? Yeah? Okay, so uh, thank you so much to the Rhode Island Historical Society uh, for inviting me. And also I wanna express my thanks to the helpful archivists at the RIHS, at the Mass Historical Society, the Providence Public Library, the Athenaeum in Boston and Providence and the Peabody and Essex Museum and Library. And I'd also like to uh, express my appreciation for the assistance of archivists and research librarians at the National Archives in London, the Family History Center in London, and the local records office in Wiltshire, uh, England. So uh, this project is uh, based on this collaboration that started a few years back. And I, I think when uh, the top, I chose to talk about uh, founding mothers, the Varen case and liberty of conscience in uh, early uh, Rhode Island history. Most um, history buffs are familiar with the story of Roger Williams and the early history of Rhode Island, but what they're not as familiar with is the story of the Varens. So in the winter of 1635-36, Roger Williams fled Massachusetts Bay Colony and he made his way to what would become uh, Providence, Rhode Island. He was accompanied by five people, including one Joshua Varon. And here in, on the Great Salt Marsh uh, in, uh, near South Main Street, where today's South Main Street, Williams and his followers set up a, quote, shelter for persons distressed of conscience. And you can see here, this is one of the early maps of the, of the community. And if you look on this, uh, but you can see that uh, Roger Williams uh, divided the land. He purchased the land from Canonicus and, uh, sorry, what happened here? Sorry, my mouse is acting up. At any rate, if you look, look on here, you can see that uh, Roger Williams, uh, just to the north of Williams, sorry, Uh, was Joshua Barron and his wife Jane Barron's uh, property. And immediately to the north of Joshua Barron was the widow Reeve, who was Jane Barron's mother. Uh, at any rate, so they were um, uh, neighbors. They came to Rhode Island together. And uh, shortly thereafter, trouble began to brew in early Providence. So early in May of 1638, uh, Williams wrote to his friend, uh, John Winthrop in Massachusetts uh, Bay Colony, asking for his advice on, quote, what to say or do to one unruly person who openly in town meeting more than once professes to hope for and long for a better government than the country hath yet, and let's not to particularize by a general governor the way which such a speech or person levels a can be no other than the raping of the fundamental liberties of the country, which ought to be dearer to us than our right eyes. So uh, in this early uh, settlement, 
They met frequently about once a fortnight to discuss common problems, uh, make decisions for the community, but they met far more frequently uh, to pray, to hear um, Williams preach, and to hear uh, the scripture. So uh, by later in that month at a town meeting on May 21st of 1638, there's this very short uh, entry. It says it was agreed that Joshua Varon, upon the breach of a covenant for restraining the liberty of conscience, shall be withheld from the liberty of voting till he shall declare to the contrary. So what Joshua Varon had done was so egregious that the majority of those at the town meeting decided to punish him um, by disenfranchising him, taking away his right uh, to vote. And the crime or the, the error that he committed was in violating liberty of conscience. But as you can see from this very, very brief entry, there's very little detail. We don't know who voted, uh, in which way, what the details are, what he actually did. Uh, and as we look further uh, in later in May, Roger Williams writes uh, a letter to John Winthrop. And in this letter, he complains about Philip Varon's son, Joshua. He calls him a boisterous and desperate man who's refused to hear the word with us for which we molested him not. But then he says, because he could not draw his wife, a gracious and modest woman to the same ungodliness with him, he hath trodden her underfoot tyrannically and brutishly. So, uh, which she and we long bearing, though with his furious blows, she went in danger of life. At last, the major vote of us to discard him from civil freedom or disfran disenfranchise him. And clearly, Joshua Varon was not happy with this. He will have justice as he clamors at other courts. And then uh, uh, Williams calls Joshua Varon a person with a foul and brutish carriage. Uh, and he mentions that God hath delivered him up and that uh, in the aftermath of this, Joshua Varon literally hailed his wife with ropes to Salem, where she must needs be troubled and troublesome as differences yet stand. Um, she apparently, despite the beating that she experienced over a period of time, long bearing, notice the emphasis on long bearing, she uh, a, a, agreed to follow him uh, and to stay with him. And uh, so Williams is quite upset with this uh, set of developments uh, in, in Rhode Island. So we have these kind of interesting questions that come up. Why did Jane Varon, uh, what did Jane Varon do that prompted her husband to beat her so savagely? Um, when it came to a woman challenging her husband's authority, Roger Williams and his, uh, his supporters in this controversy, they expected Puritan women to be submissive and obedient, but they also expected these same women to obey God. Remember that Williams described her as a gracious and modest woman. These were qualities that were deemed really uh, desirable in a woman. Uh, so the wording of Williams' description uh, leads one to indicate that there was more than one physical admonishment and that uh, she followed him um, back to uh, Salem where she continued uh, to defy him. So it, it leads us to uh, some interesting questions um, about women's agency in the early modern era. Uh, only male property owners were, who were heads of household would be admitted, admitted into what was called the fellowship of the vote. And although it was the men of Providence who had the power and the authority to decide what to do about Joshua Barron, women very much played a decisive role in the outcome. Um, Joshua's violence is important because I think it represents this ultimate basic power relationship between men and women. And the fact that he could force march his wife back 
uh, to Salem argues against female agency. On the other hand, her continued refusal to, uh, and her continued defiance after their return argues for some limited agency as well. And as the uh, sources become a little bit more clear, it becomes clear that um, the reason why uh, Joshua Varon began to punish his wife is because she defied him when he prohibited her from attending religious services as often as she desired. So uh, it's interesting because Jane Varon never left a diary. There were no letters. I don't know when she was born. Uh, she disappears uh, after 1640 from the historical record. And trying to figure out why did she do what she did uh, are interesting questions to me. And uh, so I began to look to some traditional sources. So the problem with sources, oops, sorry, is that many of the sources were written by men and many of them were written by men who were Puritan ministers. And they had a very particular slant and emphasis. So for example, in John Winthrop's history of Massachusetts Bay Colony, he describes this whole set of events uh, in a slightly different tone than Roger Williams. He said, uh, at Providence, the devil was not idle. For uh, at their first coming thither, Williams and the rest did make an order that no man should be molested for his conscience. This notion of setting up a, a shelter for people distressed of college, uh, for distressed of conscience, excuse me. And then uh, Winthrop says, now men's wives and children and servants claimed liberty uh, hereby to go to all religious meetings, though never so often or though private upon the week. And because one Varon refused to let his wife go to Mr. Williams so oft as she was called for, they required to have him censured. So we get a little bit more detail, a little bit more texture to the story. And clearly not everyone in the uh, community agreed because um, Winthrop mentions, there stood up one Arnold, a witty man of their company. And he said, when he consented to that order, meaning, liberty of conscience, no one shall be dis disturbed for their liberty of conscience. He never intended that it should extend to the breach of any ordinance of God, such as the subjection of wives to their husbands, etc., and gave a diverse um, solid reasons against it. And one man said that um, if they should restrain their wives, all of the women in the country would cry out for them. And Arnold answers, did you pretend to leave Massachusetts because you would not offend God to please men? And now would you break an ordinance and commandment of God to please women? So uh, in this little passage, it says somewhere of the opinion that if Varon would not allow his wife to have her liberty, quote, the church should dispose of her to some other man who would use her better. Uh, and here we have this sense that Jane Varon had a choice. They offered her a choice to, to find her someone who would be less cruel, who would be more respectful of her uh, liberty of conscience and not try to cur curtail her exercise of her religious duty. Uh, so, you know, I was discussing this case with a friend of mine who's um, a psychologist and she said, well, of course she went with her husband because that's what battered women do. Uh, and, I, and I said, no, you know, before they came to Rhode, I uh, Rhode Island, they lived in Salem. There are absolutely no indications in any of the records that Joshua Varon beat his wife before they came to Providence. And after they returned to Salem, Joshua Varon uh, had many uh, positions in the uh, First Church of Salem. He got lots of land grants. There are absolutely no evidence in any of the records that he beat his wife after they left Rhode Island. So it, this seems to be this kind of unique case. And my task was to try to figure out, Jane Varon, why did you behave the way you did? What motivated you? How can we understand 
uh, your actions. So uh, another kind of source that I looked at was Puritan ministerial uh, literature. So there were um, uh, basic tenets of Puritan theology to understand what, what was it about Jane Barron's faith and the way in which Puritans practiced their faith that compelled her, that made her feel obligated to act in defiance of her husband, her ministers, um, and others. So I looked at um, Puritan um, ministerial literature, uh, the way in which they believed that God had set up the discipline in his family as it was desired to be in his church, that there was this a direct uh, connection between the two. So the first care of any English Puritan was to honor God. Uh, but then there was this uh, additional responsibility to honor uh, and respect one another and to restrain any vileness or sin within that family. So, excuse me. Uh, there was this sense that religion called on people to engage and act on their conscience, engage, it was an engagement uh, to duty. Uh, there were also uh, individuals like William Perkins, most New Englanders would have been familiar with him. He was a theologian, William Bradford and Roger Williams. Uh, quoted him frequently. He taught at Christ Church in uh, Cambridge for a while, and they would become, they would go on to become some of the most noted Puritan divines uh, of the era. And in their writings, such as The Golden Chain and other works, they talk about how a good Christian should live his or her life. And it was founded on this notion of the family, that all of our foundations come with the marital relationship, the family that results, and that is the foundation for a Christian society. So uh, Perkins and others published all kinds of um, manuals and health manuals. Uh, so for example, you have this pr uh, Puritan prescriptive literature that offers advice to people who want to lead a godly life, how to make their marriages better, how to deal with uh, problems in their lives in a way that conformed with uh, their, their Puritan beliefs and practice. And again, uh, in these manuals, you can see there's this real sense that everything depends on a, a domestic harmony. So for example, William Goach, who wrote uh, Domestical Duties in 1622, and it went through, I think, eight or 10 different editions. He said, a conscionable performance of domestical and household duties tends to the good ordering of church and commonwealth as being means to fit and prepare men thereunto. So the foundation has to be the household. And he calls for a quote, loving and mutual affection between husband and wife. He says, this is the basis for all others. So uh, one historian has argued that um, Puritanism had this interesting dynamic because on the one hand, the husband's authority in the family was likened to uh, Christ uh, and the church. And so calling for loving and mutual relations um, they, they talk about, you must have this golden scepter of grace and favor to hold, out at, to hold out to his church. And yet you also have this rod of iron to break the world of men. So there was a clear recognition that people failed to lead godly lives. They failed um, in their relationships with others and that the church needed to both foster loving relationships but also in sinful behavior. So um, uh, Goge talked about love as sugar to sweeten the duties of authority which appertain to a husband, fear as salt to season all the duties of subjections which appertain to a wife. So uh, I guess he was into um, uh, the culinary arts as well. 
At any rate, uh, there's also English law that we can draw upon to find out how much violence would have been tolerated uh, within marriage and within the community. So for example, uh, Puritan ministers with their guides tried to uh, conform to e existing laws. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Puritans attempted to kind of uh, replace English common law with one based on the scripture and the parallels are really striking. So it's interesting because in these laws that we can look at, there's a disagreement on the extent to which violence against wives was tolerated uh, among 17th century Puritans. So for example, uh, William Lombardi, um, he argued in his laws that allowable battery included the rights uh, of anyone who ex exercised civil power over others. So for example, a parent had the right to discipline a child, a husband had the right to discipline a wife. But in the Laws and Resolutions of Women, uh, which was written by uh, a Puritan, the husband is not uh, allowed to beat his wife. Indeed, um, a severe beating could be grounds for uh, separation and for uh, the term that they used was dispunishable because of the laws uh, uh, as they were stated. So there's this kind of disagreement on to what extent uh, domestic violence was um, a tolerable, permissible, legal. I also looked at uh, sources that were authored by women. So for example, uh, pe petitions that women gave to the courts or to the government give us a clear sense of what their expectations were from their menfolk. And when those menfolk disappointed them, failed to meet their responsibilities to take care of the, them and their children, to provide for the household, uh, to provide sexual satisfaction in some cases. Uh, these women would go to courts and petition for some kind of redress, for some kind of support. Another interesting um, source of women's uh, voices are uh, women's advice books, particularly mother's advice books. So this one is from the early 17th century, 1630 and it's called The Mother's Council or Life Within the Compass. And as you can see on the screen, uh, there's this image and it shows women trying to live in balance, staying within the compass. So on the one side of the compass is temperance, modesty, uh, chastity, humility, uh, being out of, out of balance, you could be somebody who was unchaste, prideful, uh, intemperate, and so on. And it gives you a sense of the kind of advice that mothers gave their daughters about how to live their lives, how to be wives, how to be mothers, how to be uh, good people. And it's very much infused with uh, religious piety and religious sentiment. So, uh, Puritan conversion narratives are another really interesting way to try to get into the mind of Jane Varon. Now she didn't have a conversion narrative that, we, that I could find, but there was one um, by a woman by the name of Elizabeth Adams from Ipswich that was um, done around the same time. So to become members of the Puritan church, in most cases, you had to attest to having a faith experience, a personal experience of God's presence in your life that called you to uh, uh, repent, to reform your life, to lead a godly life in accordance with God's laws and in harmony with one another. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just read you um, a brief passage uh, from her uh, conversion narrative, because she talks about the struggle that she encountered 
uh, in trying to um, reform herself and come to terms with her own sinful nature. So uh, Elizabeth Adams, who died at the age of 31 in 1655, describes her struggles, especially her fears that she was a sinner who would not be among the elect. Her reading of the scriptures was a great comfort, particularly the passage in Romans 9.18, which states, quote, God hath mercy on whom he will have mercy. She discussed this passage with her minister, especially when her father sickened and died. She feared that he had been taken from her solely because of her sins. She also questioned whether she was earnest enough in seeking out God. Again, it was a uh, sermon preached by her minister, Mr. Rogers, that encouraged her to be patient and to wait. She struggled, especially with the sin of lust, and feared that she may die and go to hell as an unredeemed soul. When Elizabeth confided in Mr. Rogers, she shared her fear that her heart was so vile that she was beyond salvation. Rogers urged her not to give way to the temptations of such fears and reassured her that all things were possible for God. Nevertheless, Elizabeth was filled with doubts and the feelings of being under God's curse and judgment much affected her heart. She describes her predicament, quote, I then feared to stand out any longer, yet I, yet I knew not how to believe. Elizabeth Adams' conversion narrative, her tale of grace, demonstrates the real struggle that Puritan women confronted in fighting what they viewed as their sinful natures and following their conscience on the path to both hearing and answering the call of Christ. At the end of the narrative, she notes her heart was much taken with admiration of God's mercy. She found, quote, many doubtings and questions in my heart were in some way measured by the word of God. These conversion narratives remain in, uh, reveal an emotion-laden language, the fear, doubt, the, the fear devout Puritans felt should they fail to obey God's laws. Their conversions re resulted from intense periods of self-examination over a prolonged period of time, punctuated by periods of self-doubt and fear. The community of believers, their ministers, and a faithful reading of the scriptures enabled Elizabeth Adams and her husband ultimately to profess their belief that God had called them to salvation. So I argue that Jane, Adam, Jane Varon, like Elizabeth Adams, would have undergone a similar experience. Her willingness to continue with her defiance of her husband's will and to endure the repeated physical beatings testify to the strength of her religious faith. In her case, she followed the guidance of her minister, Roger Williams. Similar to Elizabeth Adams, she frequently consulted and prayed with her minister. Jane Varon attended frequent prayer meetings and sought to act in a way that conformed with the dictates of her conscience. And in both in Salem and in Providence, she followed William's guidance in challenging the legitimacy of the churches of Massachusetts and in challenging the authority of her husband when it came uh, to spiritual matters. Her mother appears to have supported her in these endeavors, okay? Puritan women were socialized to be modest, submissive, and obedient, and husbands were expected to conform to prescribed social norms as well. Uh, given the fierceness of jo Joshua Varon's carriage, one must remember that Roger Williams characterized her as gracious and modest, and yet she still disobeyed her husband. In addition to the brutality of his beatings, one can assume she was also wracked by guilt or fear that she might be disobeying God's laws by disregarding her husband's will. She must have been torn by these uh, conflicting imperatives. It is clear that like Elizabeth Adams, Jane Varon frequently consulted with um, Roger Williams and prayed with him to find the righteous way forward. Either way, she risked displeasing either God or male authorities to whom she owed allegiance and obedience. So I think the, um, the conversion narratives give us a window and entree into understanding how uh, one came to appreciate 
one's faith, one came into a closer relationship with God, and then uh, chose to uh, follow through on that faith in ways that sometimes defied uh, authority. So the title of this uh, is actually Founding Mothers. And uh, what I wanted to do then in the time that's remaining to me is just tell you about a couple of, uh, of the women who were in Providence at the time of the Varen decision. Uh, and what I'm going to argue is that these women formed a kind of a spirit group. They were a community of like-minded individuals that when it came to matters of conscience, were willing to defy male authority, whether it was their husbands, their ministers, uh, church leaders, uh, or others. And I also found in reconstructing the biographies of everyone, there were roughly 50 people present in Providence at the time of the Varen decision, I found that there was this um, common experience that many of the uh, people who were in Providence in 1638 already had experiences that predated their arrival in Providence. Often they had experiences that predated um, their arrival in uh, the British American colonies. So they were people who were willing to uh, defy authority in defense of individual conscience. And I argue that this, these women, these founding mothers, exerted both a tacit and an indirect influence on the male decision makers, resulting in the uh, community condemning Joshua Barron. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, one of the uh, women was this uh, widow Reeve. She was the mother of uh, Jane Varon. And little is known about either Jane Varon's uh, origins or even her surname. Uh, I'm not sure, for example, if her mother, if that was her first or her second marriage, but both of them were members of the community of saints. Both had testified to faith experiences as a, as a condition of church membership. Uh, and Jane Varon's mother herself had been excommunicated from the First Church of Salem, along with uh, Jane, Marjorie Holloman, and Mary Oliver, uh, for being a follower of Roger Williams and defying the uh, authority of the local ministers. So uh, she owned, she was a landowner, both in Providence and in Salem. And she was, uh, would most likely, having followed her daughter, would have supported the decision uh, to punish um, Joshua Varon. Another person who was an interesting kind of story uh, was Alice Daniels. Uh, Daniels was born in Dorset, England in 1597. And sometime um, before 1630, she was married to a man by the name of Richard Beggarly. Apparently their marriage had severe difficulties because she ended up coming to New England without her uh, husband. She sued for divorce. Um, she was a well-educated woman of stature in the community. Shortly before Roger Williams fled to Providence, she was granted controlling interest in the estate of um, Reverend Samuel Skelton. And he was the, the pastor of the first church organized by English migrants uh, in Massachusetts Bay. Uh, and Roger Williams was actually his co-pastor. So she uh, handled the estate of the Reverend Skelton after his death. Uh, she was a member of the uh, church, uh, First Church of Salem, and subsequently received a lot of land grants both in Massachusetts Bay and in this new settlement uh, in Providence. So she appeared on a couple of different um, uh, lists of Providence landowners, and in 1638, she married John Green. So John Green had a long association with the Varon family. He was a surgeon in Salisbury. He was a member of the same church as the Varons before they left England. And uh, his first wife actually arrived on the same ship as the Varons. Um, although uh, Daniels could not vote in town matters, it is not inconceivable that her opinion may have uh, uh, 
influenced some of the decision makers. She was clearly associated with Roger Williams, who had carefully guarded religious liberties against any usurpations. Also interesting is that uh, she, was, she and her husband were known for their considerable uh, medical knowledge. Uh, so they lived three houses away from the Varens, three house lots away. And it's not inconceivable that when she was beaten and in uh, fear of her life, that they would have called, been called upon to uh, provide medical assistance to a woman who had been beaten so severely that her neighbors feared that she would die from the severity of her beatings. So um, I argue that given these circumstances, it is highly likely that both John Green and his wife, Alice Daniels, would have supported the decision to censure Joshua Varon. Another interesting uh, story uh, or, or biography is the woman, Margaret Weston. Uh, she was born in Great Badau, Essex Church, excuse me, England in around 1570. Uh, she was married when she was um, 16 years old, had two sons, and her husband died in 1623. Sometime later, um, she married a man by the name of Francis Weston, and they had a daughter, Lucy. The three of them appear on the passenger list of the Mary and John, which was part of the uh, Winthrop fleet that arrived in Plymouth in 1630. Uh, they moved to Salem. They were admitted to the Salem church. Uh, and uh, so they were members of the same church. So uh, in the records is this entry that John Pizzi, her, uh, let's see, he was her second son, her younger son, uh, shall be whipped and bound to his good behavior for striking his mother, Mrs. Weston, and deriding of her and for diverse, excuse me, other misdemeanors and other evil carriages. So what is significant here, I think, uh, is that Margaret Weston, like Jane Varon, was a victim of family violence. See, she also had a history of challenging the authorities of Massachusetts Bay. So for example, Bo in the Essex Quarterly Court, uh, she's cited for having challenged three of the uh, jurymen in uh, Salem. And then later on, um, she is cited for and called on to be censured for uh, refusing to uh, uh, attend religious services. So uh, Margaret Weston has this common experience um, uh, uh, as with other women in Providence at the time. And I think this would have uh, influenced her to influence her husband uh, to vote in support of the um, decision to censure Joshua Barron. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also wanted to talk about Mary Sweet Holloman. <clears throat> she was an interesting uh, woman. Uh, she was born in 1581, married John Sweet uh, in 1619, had two sons, arrived in Salem in 1632. And she also lived next to uh, the Reverend Skelton, uh, the person who was the pastor of the church uh, in Salem. And given what's been described as this dense network of social interactions uh, in Salem, it's highly likely that um, Mary Sweet knew Alice Daniels, who was the uh, executrix of Reverend Skelton's um, estate. They were reunited in Providence where the Greens and the Hollemans were neighbors. Her husband died in 1637, uh, and she later married Ezekiel Holloman. Now, Holloman was known as, quote, a leader of the followers of William, Roger Williams. Uh, he, like uh, Mary Sweet Holloman, um, was a person who rejected the authority of some of the ministers in, in, in Massachusetts Bay. Um, she's listed by the Reverend uh, Hugh Peter uh, as one who had, quote, wholly refused to hear the word uh, at Church of Salem. 
So these were uh, men and women who were together in Providence, who had a common history of acting on their uh, a conscience, rejecting uh, what they believed what might be uh, incorrect interpretations by the ministers, and acting in defiance of those ministers and suffering the consequences for it. So these brief little biographies, uh, I think, give us a sense then that, uh, sorry, there was a community of both men and women in uh, Massachusetts, in, in Rhode Island, that contributed to the decision making, the ultimate decision to punish Joshua Varon for having violated his, his wife's uh, liberty of conscience. Um, we know about uh, Anne Hutchinson and Mary Dyer. They're uh, fairly well-known women uh, from early colonial history. Uh, the Varon family history is not as well known. And by looking at the Varon family and looking at the circumstances leading to the decision to uh, punish Joshua Varon for violating his wife's liberty of conscience, we get a sense that there were far more women than has been per previously acknowledged that were willing to challenge the social order and suffer the consequences for it. Um, one of the other kind of interesting things about this is that um, the lives of these founding mothers, their experiences and the influence that they exerted and shared with their husbands, uh, has, one historian has argued that, quote, the private actions of ordinary citizens have affected the larger social and political movements as profoundly as the deeds of great famous men. And, um, you may know that in the Charter of 1663, uh, the Charter uses a very gender neutral language to reaffirm every citizen's um, inviolable liberty, right to liberty of conscience. And I think that uh, one of the reasons why that uh, is so gender neutral is because of the debates that uh, the townspeople in Providence engaged in over the limits of family violence. Um, what do we weigh first? A woman's duty to obey her husband versus a woman's duty to obey her conscience. Um, duty to God versus duty to uh, uh, a husband or male mentors. So I think there's some really interesting uh, questions that uh, can uh, enlighten us. There were no courts in Rhode Island this early, so there's no precedent for subsequent cases involving women's rights in Rhode Island. But I think if we examine it, both in the context of things that happened in Old England and in New England, uh, Jane, per Jane Varon's plight, it clarified the extent to which residents of Rhode Island would support an individual's liberty of conscience some would support her right to liberty of conscience, but not when that challenge represented a threat to the male governorship in the Puritan social order. And ultimately then, although the colony was very young, the Varen case forced Williams and others to confront uh, some of the issues that were undermining the quiet and calm of the British North American colonies, the right to dissent within the Church of England, the issue of liberty of conscience, uh, the differing positions within Puritanism on the issue of domestic violence, uh, the place of women in Puritan social and religious life, and how civil government would respond to these developments. So that's it for me. I'm happy to take any questions or um, uh, welcome any comments that you may have. Thank you so much for your attention. Right. Thanks so much, Margaret. Um, I have somebody that has asked about asking a question. <laughs> so I'm going to wait for that to come in. I did have something that came through privately. So let me ask that one first. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so you said that there weren't records of, um, of, Baron, of Baron being beaten in Salem. Does that mean Salem didn't take the type, this type of thing seriously enough to record it? 
Are there any other recorded cases of women being beaten in Salem? Yes, there absolutely are. Not many. Um, it was relatively rare, uh, but there were cases of domestic violence, uh, sometimes uh, parents beating their children, parents beating um, uh, servants. Those were all considered part of the, the, the household. But there were uh, cases of husbands beating their wives, uh, one of a wife beating her husband uh, as well. So yes, uh, it, it, it did happen, but not very frequently. Interesting. Great. Um, anybody else have any questions? Um, Adrian, uh, you had asked about asking a question. Feel free to type in the chat if you'd like. Anybody else, if you have anything you'd like to ask um, Dr. Manchester, feel free to type in the chat and um, I'm happy to share them. <laughs> I think there's a new question, but I wanted to ask um, Dr. Manchester, do you mind un stop sharing so we can see you better? Oh, <laughs> yes. So, oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know that um, uh, I had a fall on the bike path this past Saturday. And so as you can see, I had this whopper of a shiner and a friend of mine uh, offered to give me um, some kind of um, stage makeup to hide it. And I said, you know, I'm going to be talking about domestic violence in early Rhode Island history. Maybe it's kind of appropriate uh, that I just um, let the shiner shine. So anyway. Um, I just realized the question was sent to me privately, Jennifer, oh, so you don't oh. see it. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Thank you. I've been waiting. <laughs> so, so someone is asking, um, uh, Professor Manchester, how you approach the research on on individual female householders in Providence? Well, you know, we did, I had a group of grad students that came in with me and we scoured. What we tried to do was we tried to get whatever information we could. We looked at house lots, passenger lists, church membership roles, uh, land, uh, early court records, early uh, just whatever sources that we could find, genealogical records, to try to reconstruct um, the lives of um, marriage records, um, to reconstruct as much information as we could about the roughly 50 people who were in Providence at the time. And by looking at when did they come? Did they come on the same ship? Where did they come from? Did they come from the same town? Did they belong to the same parish? Um, did they have the other experiences in common? Uh, we tried to look for ways in which uh, to build these biographies and to get a sense of what impelled these people to, um, to act and uh, what motivated them and to try to use that as context setting them for um, understanding what happened to Jane Varen. I hope I answered the question you were asking. It was a bit of a puzzle. Uh, it sounds like it would be. Um, and hold on one second. I'm so sorry. Uh, I am asking somebody if they would like to unmute themselves to ask a question. Um, hold on one second. Let me just unmute. All right. So um, Dr. Manchester, we have um, Adrian to ask you a question. Uh, yeah, my question, I, I joined the uh, meeting late, your, your lecture late, as I was taking a nap. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my son is a descendant of Christopher Omthank, who uh, came to Providence uh, with Roger Williams. They were in Salem together. Mm -hmm. And uh, his, um, his daughter married in Almy. And uh, then the husband, the, you know, the son-in-law died. And then the, Christopher and his grandson came up to Southboro, Massachusetts. And the grandson took the Onthank name, which is why I used to be El Mrs. Elmer Alonzo Onthank III. Mm. But um, Christopher Onthank was um, a, a landowner and probably a member of that church. And I don't know if you had mentioned him as part of the group of people who was setting judgment. 
No, yeah, and you know, the, the problem is, is that there's no list of everybody who attended the meeting. There's no minutes of the meeting. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, minutes of who voted which way. So we piece it together earlier in the presentation. I was piecing it together from fragments, from uh, letters, from other histories, John Winthrop's uh, writings and so on. So uh, I didn't uh, mention him. I was more focused on uh, uh, the women. I, I know that um, Christopher Onthank and Roger Williams would be um, notaries or witnesses in land deeds and grants to yeah. the various colony members. Yeah, you know, uh, in, the, in the larger work, I just focused on one small section. Yeah. But one of the things that I argue is that the Varen case, there were already disagreements brewing among um, some of the early founders. Uh, for example, some of the younger uh, men uh, wanted a greater say in the government. Uh, there were disagreements on um, how to treat, uh, respond to the Indians. Uh, they wanted to use the old English method, um, and which would have deprived the Indians of some of their uh, rights of access to uh, waterways, et cetera. Uh, there were some who said, you know, we, we want more, more government. There's not enough order here. This is too chaotic. So somebody like Green and Roger uh, uh, Joshua Varon were among those who were clamoring for more. And I argue that, the that this kind of debate about uh, what happened to, uh, should Joshua Varon be punished? I mean, he was acting on his conscience in disciplining his wife because a wife was uh, expected to defer to her husband's authority. Uh, so what if he was acting on his conscience? Why are we punishing him uh, in deference to her? So there's all of these issues that royal the colony um, at the time and uh, the antinomians are present. So just before this um, uh, event, uh, and Hutchinson and some of her supporters had already uh, gotten a land grant from Roger Williams in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Uh, so there were a lot of things that were going on. And one of the big differences was, uh, do we, in order to maintain order, do we all enforce the same order? In other words, do we expect everybody in this uh, wilderness to comply by the rules everybody needs to do uh, what is expected, or do we give people um, some liberty of conscience? And so for somebody like Roger Williams, he said forced worship stinks in God's nostrils. But there were these debates among uh, some of the founders as well that contributed um, to uh, some divisions amongst them. It's really fascinating. Um... I have another question for you. Uh, this project seemed to be a si significant departure from other scholarship uh, of yours. What challenges did you face going so far outside of your comfort zone? Well, <clears throat> you know, I did my um, doctoral dissertation on Eisenhower's Middle East policy. And Eisenhower was a military man and he organized his national security in such a way that any policy, any suggested revision any suggested revision to the revision was all documented. Uh, and moving from that to the pre-modern era, where a lot of the records were destroyed by fire during Indian wars, uh, women often are invisible in early American uh, records. Um, couverture meant that uh, once a woman married, she was covered by her husband's uh, and so she ceased to have uh, a legal identity separate from that of her husband. So often women disappeared from the records. So having fragmentary and incomplete records or no records meant that you had to kind of widen the net and look at a variety of different sources to try to get a sense of what the worldview was that compelled a woman like Jane Varen um, to act the way that she did. And, you know, we live in a very secular society and to try to put yourself into the main set, ma mindset 
of a very devout woman who's willing to risk life and limb in, to follow her religious conscience. It, it, that's, you know, that presents uh, challenges for the modern scholar. And I think, you know, there's a whole set of historiography in terms of Puritanism, uh, early American women, uh, the British Atlantic world. So it was, it, it took a long time. It was a long gestation period uh, for this uh, project to come about. But I was teaching women's courses and I wanted to uh, engage in research that more closely aligned with some of what uh, I was teaching. So it was a challenge and it was a joy. Um, that sounds like a really interesting pivot to go from your earlier work to this and having to really think outside the box in different ways to, to research and gather information. But um, this is wonderful. Um, so I have a couple more questions. Uh, for the next one, I'm going to unmute the person. So Catherine, I'm asking you to unmute. Great. Thank you so much. And Dr. Manchester, it's wonderful Thank to see you. Catherine. So wonderful <laughs> to see you too. Thank you. I, uh, so um, Professor Manchester was my professor at Providence College, and I'm a professor now, and I've got some of my students that are here as well right now, so it's a really nice continuum here. Um, so thank you. Um, I wanted to just say, first of all, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, your thesis is so incredibly compelling, um, fascinating the sources that you found and that you've been able to dredge up. And I was just wondering if you were able to um, locate any exciting non-traditional primary sources. Um, I know the Rhode Island Historical Society has some really cool things in their collection. And I was just wondering if, you know, you had to kind of use whatever you could to piece the story together. Whatever, whatever I could, absolutely. Um, you know, I think also uh, the genealogical records were particularly useful in trying to create, recreate these biographies of the individuals there. But no, I, I can't think of anything particularly unique. Um, sorry, sorry to disappoint. Um, all right. Oh, hold on one second. I went to full screen by accident. Um, I have another question up for you. And it is, uh, were women allowed, or yes, I'm sorry, were women allowed to be members of the church? And how is it that Mrs. Varon went to church on her own? Yes. So um, one of the interesting things about Puritanism um, is that Puritanism tends to be uh, very hierarchical. You know, everyone is expected to know their place in, in the society. So children were expected to defer to their elders. Uh, wives were expected to defer to their husbands. Men were expected to defer to their ministers or magistrates. And everybody was expected to defer to God. And knowing one's place meant that you had certain rights and duties um, uh, as part of a well-ordered society. So where was I going with this? Well, marriage, on the other hand, was seen as more of a reciprocal uh, relationship. And what was interesting about Puritanism is that Puritans believed that everyone could be saved if they were called by God. They could be chosen by God to be among the elect. So men and women alike uh, could be chosen by God uh, for salvation. Uh, and so that created interesting uh, issues if a wife had a personal conversion experience, but her husband did not. Uh, and in the case of the Varens, where uh, because she was following the guidance of her minister, um, she, in following the guidance of her minister, she was uh, disobeying her husband. So there was these, these tensions within the relationship. But women did uh, become church members and in fact, you can look at church roles, Salem and so on, that there are, they often list the first members and there were many women amongst the congregants. Um, you had to have some kind of a personal uh, testament of, to your faith. So, uh, uh, a, and what was interesting about that is that sometimes the women would give these testaments to their faith experience in public 
And at other times, depending on the church, uh, they would do it in private to the minister because women were expected to be more in the private sphere. So some churches, um, women could testify to their faith on a Wednesday, but not on a Sunday. So they had all these kind of uh, little differences, but yes, women were the backbone of the church uh, in many instances. That's really fascinating. Um, we've gotten a lot of comments about how interesting the presentation was. Um, I found this really uh, an, uh, an interesting way to celebrate and honor the centennial for women's suffrage this year. Uh, the Rhode Island Historic Society is doing a lot of programming around women's history. Um, and I think this is the farthest back that we've gone back in, uh, in Rhode Island history around women's uh, history in particular. So thank you so much for this. Um, my yeah, uh, this is wonderful. Um, for everybody that has joined us tonight, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, as you all know, the talk tonight was recorded and it will be up on our YouTube page, which is brand new, uh, probably within the next week or so. Uh, we encourage you to revisit again if you want to hear the talk one more time um, and then also to follow our YouTube page. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Dr. Manchester. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. All right, take care everybody, have a good night. Good night, thank you.